can change World War II, the greatest generation, but maybe not for all. Tommy Ketta of Den Show today is with us. Tom, welcome. Thank you. Den Show, what does that mean? Well, Den Show is, is a Japanese uh, word that means to pass stories on to the next generation. And so our, our project is a, is a legacy project. You know, we want to collect the stories of Japanese Americans who during World War II were incarcerated and pass those stories on to future generations. And actually, it was an interesting story about how Den Show got started because when we first started interviewing Japanese Americans or asking them to be interviewed, many of them said no. They said, uh, you know, the stories were too painful. Uh, so we said, so what, why won't you, you talk? And they said, well, you know, we know the story. Why should we tell people? And it wasn't until we said, well, how about the future generations? And once we said that, they, it clicked for them. They said, it's really important that their grandchildren, great-grandchildren hear about the story. So that's how Den Show uh, got started. As a Caucasian American, um, I'm completely surprised by this entire story. I didn't know very much about it myself. Ang it makes me angry that we incarcerated Americans just because you were of Japanese descent. Well, you're, you're Caucasian. Um, you know, here I was a, a young Japanese American, and I was in high school when I first really found out about this. And so if you can imagine, here, my, my parents were, were put in concentration camps during World War II. All my grandparents were, were put into these camps. And I didn't really know about this. Um, I heard growing up, you know, this reference to a camp. And, and I actually thought it was a summer camp that the Japanese American community went to. And it wasn't until su uh, high school that I read, um, a teacher had me read a, a novel about it. And I would then go back and ask my parents, so what happened? You know, I remember my parents telling me in a way that I, I knew it was something that they didn't really want to talk about. You know, how, how parents could, uh, they don't want to lie to their children, mm -hmm. but then they'll, they'll only tell them just a little bit and then sort of stop. And then after you ask a few questions, you realize, well, they don't want to talk about this. And so when you said you were surprised, here I was, a, a high school junior, really finding out about this for the first time, thinking, wow, why, why don't I know about this? And so it, it is something that you know, many Americans don't know. And, and that really led to the genesis of this project, that we felt that we have to capture these stories so that people will know what happened. And what I heard you say, were you in high school in the United States? Yes, so uh, in Seattle, uh, public high school. Seattle was a, a, one of the centers where there was a large Japanese American community before the war. So you have about you know, 7,000 U.S. citizens that were taken from Seattle and put into camps. And this is along with about 120,000 you know, Japanese Americans along wow. the West Coast. And I know that people out there watching want me to ask this question, even though I know the answer to it. You don't speak with an accent. How come? Well, so I'm third generation. So my uh, family has been in Seattle for over 100 years. My grandparents came in the early 1900s. And so when people you know, talk about Seattle, I'm, I'm very proud that um, you know, I'm a third generation Seattleite, except for three and a half years when my family was taken from Seattle and put into a concentration camp in Idaho. The Civil Liberties Act of 1988, that seemed to be in the, in the study that I did leading up to this, coming off of the Den Show well, website. By the way, denshow.org is a fantastic website. We strongly encourage you to go to it to learn more. What did you know about that act at the time? I was in, into my career um, in the high-tech area. And, and so at that point, I was, I was, just, um, I was aware of the movement. And it was a, a really powerful time for the, uh, for the Japanese American community. As I mentioned earlier, the community didn't really talk very much about what happened during World mm -hmm. War II. In the 70s, um, in particular, there was a recognition by the by community members that unless um, the government apologized for what happened, because the, the, at this point, the, the community knew that there was no wrongdoing. Uh, Japanese Americans did nothing wrong during World War II. And yet, there was this cloud hanging over the community because you know, nothing was ever done in terms of uh, research or apology by the government. And so the, the, uh, the community felt it was really important for uh, the government to recognize that a wrongdoing had happened and for them to apologize. During the 70s and 80s, was called the redress movement, 
where the community started this grassroots campaign to start educating the rest of the country and then asking the, the government for an apology. And that culminated in the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. Mm -hmm. And then in the mid-90s, you founded Dencho. Correct. Who is this for? Is this for uh, Japanese Americans? Is this for people who don't know anything about this? What is this for? It, it's really the latter. Um, when we started the project, um, many people didn't want to talk because they said, well, we know the story, so don't preserve the story for us. But if we're preserving the story for the rest of America, then, then that can be much more powerful. Having said that, you know, with a, you know, being a small nonprofit with limited resources, we weren't really able to, to, to launch this large marketing campaign in terms of what happened to Japanese Americans. Instead, we really focused our, our resources to collect the stories. So for the first 18 years of our existence, we've been really focused on, on doing these in-depth oral history interviews of Japanese Americans who were uh, uh, placed in camps during World War II. And right now, we're starting to uh, create curriculum, uh, you know, videos, and other things from these materials so that we can now sort of you know, outreach and, and tell the rest of the country. And thank you very much. We appreciate the fact that you're going to let us play one of those clips, and we're going to play that right now. I had just come home from church, and then we kept hearing, you know, Pearl Harbor was bombed, Pearl Harbor was bombed. I had no idea where Pearl Harbor was. My geography was not that sophisticated. I had no idea, and my father said, uh oh, there's going to be trouble. And I said, well, how come, you know? He said, well, Japan just bombed Pearl Harbor. And he says, we're at war with Japan. But I thought, why should it bother me? You know, I'm uh, American. And then he said, you know, we are aliens my parents. We don't have the citizenship, so they're going to do something, you know. He says, we'll probably get taken away. But at that time, my parents had no f feeling that we would be removed because, so they were saying my brother would have to take on the responsibility to keep the family together because they may be removed or put into camp or whatever. And, and uh, then when I went back to school that following morning, you know, December 8th, one of the teachers said, you people bomb Pearl Harbor. And I'm going, my people, you know. All of a sudden, my Japanese-ness became very aware to me. And listening to Aki, was that a normal story? I mean, she was a, a teenage girl in high school. Yeah, so Aki talked about how you know, before December 7th, uh, 1941, she really thought of herself as this sort of all-American teenage girl and growing up in Seattle at again a, a large public high school and thought of herself as an American and then on December 7th after the bombing and then going to school the next day and having a teacher um, say you people bomb Pearl Harbor all of a sudden because Aki you know, looked like the enemy she was being treated like the enemy and so that was, a, again, a story we heard over and over again from Japanese Americans. You know, very similar, um, you know, this is a, a slight tangent, but right after 9-11, I was doing some interviews with Japanese Americans. And so I asked the question, so what were you thinking after you heard about 9-11? And almost all of them, you know, said the same thing. They said, we all thought about those poor Arab Americans and Muslims because we knew that they were going to be targeted the same way that we were. And it, it, it shocked me when they said that. Because at first I thought, wow, they're going to say, oh, those poor people who died. But right away they thought about the, the, the people that sort of looked like the enemy and how they were going to be treated. You've been collecting stories like Aki's for 18 years. Is there a common thread throughout the stories? Yeah, you know, I think the, the, the common thing, um, you know, my, my background is um, actually in, in engineering. I look at things, uh, I was trained to look at things a little more black and white. You know, you know, what is the perhaps the best way to get something done? When it comes to the stories, um, what I had to learn was it's, it's very gray that, that the stories are all different. They're all very unique. And I had to start learning uh, to hear that, to not try to think, so what, you know, what's the common theme and try to you know, put someone into that 
sort of template of, of that experience and rather trying to let that story unfold in different ways. So that was going in and doing the interviews. I've done about 200 oral histories is to not go in there with a preconceived sort of thought in terms of this is what happened to that person and this is how that person felt to just really be open to that. Did, were whole families incarcerated or, or was it just the, the adults? Yeah, so whole families. So when I uh, mentioned earlier 120,000 Japanese Americans who were, were placed in camps, uh, that ranged from babies all the way to you know, people in their 90s. And uh, the only um, criteria used was, was this person of Japanese ancestry. And so it didn't have to do whether or not they were perceived as dangerous. It was very much based on race alone. I, I hate to say this, but this question immediately pops up in my mind. So how were we, the United States then, different from the Germans who were essentially ethnically cleansing? Yeah, no, I, th that's a good question. I mean, that's, that goes to the heart of what, um, in, in terms of our education, what we're trying to do. Um, when we uh, think about our, our country, especially during times of, of fear, like if we have a war or terrorist action, um, what became clear to me, and again, going back to 9-11, uh, was how fearful we can become. You know, I, I travel a lot, and when, um, you know, after 9-11, I remember being afraid to travel, you know, to actually get on an airplane. As, as much as my training um, in terms of, you know, this history, knowing that this is wrong, I mean, you would kind of scan the, the airplane looking for suspicious people. And uh, you know that was, was totally wrong, but it's, it's almost this human reaction. And so after 9-11, I, I sort of got how fear can really push us to do things that we don't want to do. It's, it's something very primal mm -hmm. in us. And, and so going back to 1941, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, you look at the information. I've interviewed people from that era. People were frightened. And... Um, in addition to people being frightened, you look at things like the media, you know, the press, the papers, and how you know, they sensationalized what was going on. They, they actually generated a lot of war hysteria. Um, and, and you look at this, and they were trying to sell newspapers. I, I think similar things happen to our country today, that when I look at the cable news... Uh, the, I try not to do that. <laughs> well, and, 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 and the news stations that get the, the highest ratings are sometimes the ones that are the most sensational. And that's what happened back in the 40s uh, with the newspapers. You know, the more sensational they were about the Japanese threat on the West Coast, the more newspapers they sold. So they were generating a huge amount of fear. And so when you ask, how could this happen in the United States, uh, there was that combination of we were at war, uh, people were afraid, and then you have the media really playing up that, that, that war hysteria, that that sensationalism. So that all came into play. You know, you're being really very kind about this. You don't sound angry. And frankly, I think you should be. When I first started this project, I was much more angry about what happened. The thing that I think impressed me the most about the people I interviewed, uh, and these are the, the elders in our, in our community who were put in the camps, was their sense that it's, it's really important that it not happen again. And the best way for that to happen is to share in a way that really doesn't point fingers in terms of, of making people wrong, but trying to get people to understand how these things happen. That, that you know, almost by nature, we have our prejudices about you know, people, and uh, whether it's uh, sexism, ageism, racism. We, we all have these tendencies, and that we, we need to understand that, that these exist. And then when you layer in things like um, war or a terrorist act where fear comes in play, we just have to be careful that that's a, a very dangerous mixture that can cause something like what happened to Japanese Americans or, you know, I think some of the hate crimes that hap happened after 9-11 or sometimes even how we target immigrants because, again, these are, are groups that we don't know as much about and we perceive them as, as being dangerous. And so... Going back to this lack of, of anger, I, I think of myself in a role of a more educator rather than uh, in terms of an activist trying to, to change something. And again, going back to your really early question about the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, 
I think by the government recognizing they did uh, something wrong, apologizing to Japanese Americans, and actually paying them a, a redress payment, actually brought closure to a lot of that anger, that we can move forward because of that. And while we've talked about fear uh, as being uh, a, a primary and very public reason for the incarceration, I think you've uncovered indications that perhaps it just wasn't fear. There may have even been some economic motives behind it. Right. I, I think, um, you know, in our country today, I think almost everything um, is driven by the economics. Mm -hmm. And when I, I look at um, what happened on the West Coast and compare it to what happened in the islands of Hawaii. So uh, there were about 140,000 Japanese Americans in Hawaii where the attack happened. The military commander there said it was actually a military necessity to keep Japanese Americans there. But more than military necessity, it was, it was an economic necessity. The Japanese Americans were about one-third of the workforce in Hawaii. And if they actually took away the Japanese labor force in Hawaii, the economy would have tanked. And so there was a lot of pressure from plantation owners and other business owners to keep Japanese there. And then you contrast it now to the West Coast, where Japanese were perceived as an economic threat to many of the farmers because they were competitors. The, the Japanese were um, um, very strong in the, the area of, say, truck farming, mm -hmm. where uh, in terms of vegetables and fruits, uh, they dominated many of the markets. In Seattle, they were about half of the uh, Pike Place market in terms of the stalls and selling. And so from an economic reason, many uh, people wanted the Japanese to leave and, uh, uh, and not come back because they were such fierce competitors. You said you've had 18 years of, of collecting stories. What are some of your favorite ones? Um, you know, for me, the story of the Japanese Americans, uh, the men, who were in camp, and when they were able to, they, they volunteered into the army and fought. Um, so, the, wait a minute now, they were incarcerated, their families were incarcerated, and they were volunteering to fight for their incarcerators? Yes, so um, it, it gets to the question of, you know, what do you do if you're a, a loyal American when something like this happens? And for many of the men, they felt that they needed to really show the country that they were loyal to, to America. And uh, so many of them, in that situation you just described, here they are, put in camps with their families, uh, behind barbed wire, essentially in you know, a, a, a prison. And they volunteered to fight. And what the government did was they, they actually weren't really sure about uh, Japanese Americans, so they put them in a segregated unit that fought in Europe, and it was called the uh, 442nd Regimental Combat Team. To this day, this unit is the most highly decorated uh, military unit in American history for its size and, and duration of service, uh, primarily because of the number of Purple Hearts, that so many of them uh, were injured uh, or killed in action during their battles in Europe. Um, you know, there's, there's one battle in particular that I remember. It's called the Rescue of the Lost Battalion where um, there was a unit of uh, Texans, about 200 of them, that were completely surrounded by the Germans. And uh, for days, other American units tried to save them, but no one could break through. And so they, they ordered the, uh, the Japanese American unit to go save them. And so for three days, they, they fought, and they, they kept going, and their motto was, go for broke, that they would never give up. And after three days, they finally broke through and saved those 200 men, and they rescued them. But they took over 800 casualties to save yeah. those men. And, uh, and so th there's stories like that that our community has heard. Um, in particular for me, it's, it's personal because my, my mother's brother, uh, my uncle, was killed in action in Europe. So it was a very uh, difficult time for the community in terms of losses, but yet um, it just really showed people the, you know, the loyalty that they had for this country. Through the stories, what was it like in these, and I don't even want to call them camps, let's call them prisons, because as you point out, I mean, if, if your freedom is restricted, you're in prison. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in fact, they, they're called concentration camps. That, you know, it, it's a term that many people have difficulties because of what happened in Europe with the Nazis. Yeah. But when you, you look at the documentation in terms of what President Roosevelt called these, he actually used the term concentration camp. And it's something that, again, I think most Americans have a difficulty in, in saying, but 
as the sort of documents come out and as we study it, we realize they were concentration camps. What were they like? Well, so they, they weren't like the, the death camps that right. the, the Nazis had. Um, they were um, put in the most sort of desolate areas in America, you know, usually inland on either you know, close to desert land or swamps. And they would just clear it and quickly assemble these barracks uh, where people would, would have to live. And they put barbed wires around it. And so uh, people lived there for three and a half years. Were there incidents where people tried to break out? Uh, there, there were cases where people would you know, go outside the perimeter and, and actually go fishing up into the mountains. and uh, So nothing like a, a mass uh, sort of a breakout. But there were disturbances. There, there were cases where there were um, you know, internal, and people have called them like riots, uprisings, because the conditions were so bad and that they felt that uh, you know, maybe guards or administrators were profiting on the black market so that food wasn't getting into the camp, so there would be strikes and things like that. Tell me more about that. So there were people who were profiting off of, of the black market from food that didn't get into the camp? Sure. So you know, during World War II, uh, foodstuffs were, were very uh, tight. So things like sugar, meat, and things like that that were um, supposed to go to the camp oftentimes didn't make it all the way. And so they would soon figure out that from the warehouse, uh, some of this was being uh, moved elsewhere. And so people would go on strike saying that unless this gets fixed, you know, we, we won't work or we won't do things. What would people do who were, who were in the camps? I mean, what would they do all day? So that, that was, it, it's probably like being in prison. It's like you have all this time on your hand. And uh, the stories that I heard from people were uh, things like you know, just fighting the boredom. It's really hard. Um, a difficult thing for families, um, you know, before the, the, uh, the war, the, you know, the Japanese Americans' families were very close, very you know, nuclear, you know, oftentimes multi-generational with a grandparent, parents, and children. In, in the camp, um, that really uh, fell apart because now all of a sudden you're in a cafeteria style eating. And so the kids would just go to the cafeteria, oftentimes with their friends, and you would see this breakdown in terms of the normal sort of you know, family sitting around the table eating dinner or, or lunch together. So your culture was also damaged as right, well. Right, right. I mean, any family's culture would be damaged in that. Were there schools? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there were schools. Um, oftentimes the schools weren't as good as what uh, um, students had outside the camp because it was hard to get really qualified teachers to come in. Um, but many of them um, were allowed, especially at the university level, after they graduated from high school, to actually leave the camps and go to universities inland, so off the west coast, either on the east coast or the midwest. Oh, so they, they were allowed uh, at least to go to college. Then. Right, so they, they allowed people to leave the camps for either school, to, to go into the military, uh, like the story I told before, mm -hmm. or to as a work sort of program too, if they can qualify for that. You also said that grandparents were were there as well, and we, so when we're talking about grandparents, we're talking about older people. Yes. How much of a threat were they? Well, again, when you think about uh, you know uh, elderly people uh, in one of the camps, Mansnar, they even had an orphanage, uh, so they were taking uh, children who were uh, of Japanese ancestry from foster homes, from other orphanage, orphanages, and, and bring them into the Manzanar concentration camp. And again, so it goes to your question, you know, how dangerous could these orphans be? But that was, you know, that was the law of the land during that mm -hmm. time. Do any of these camps exist today as a memorial, if you will? Uh, yes, the, the National Park Service um, has started a, a program to preserve uh, some of these sites. And so the most developed site right now is Manzanar down in California in the Owens Valley. And there are other sites at the uh, Minidoka, Idaho site and Tule Lake site that are just starting. So they, they are starting to do that. From your discussions, and goodness, I'm just looking at the clock here. We don't have a whole lot of time left. I, I wish we had several hours. I, again, I strongly encourage you to go to the website, denshaw.org. It is amazing. But from your discussions, what was the feeling when people got out? Did they want to stay? Did they want to go to Japan? Did they want to go to Canada? Did they want to go somewhere else? No, that's, that's a really good question. Um, and, 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 a, and a question that most uh, scholars and literature does not really get into. Um, 
if you can imagine you're you're sort of inst institutionalized for three and a half years you're in this camp you're you're being told that the rest of the country um, doesn't want you uh, they're they're afraid of you um, they think you're a threat and now you're you're closing the camps you're being pushed out there with essentially a bus ticket or a train ticket and twenty five dollars and you have nothing else and so were your assets seized too um, well, many of them just lost everything. I mean, when they left, uh, if the, you're living in an apartment, you just pick up whatever you have and, and go. Mm -hmm. And gradually, your assets you were probably drained over the course of the year. Um, but you then go back into a place like coming back to Seattle, where the American public was told that you were, are a danger to society. And so you come back to this very hostile environment, can't get a job, um, you're thrown out there. It's, it's actually the period of time when things like uh, the level of suicides and things like that really skyrocketed in the community because it was so difficult. What ended up happening with most of the people, though? Did they, did they go back to work in the communities where they came from? Or uh, what was the feeling? Um, how did people feel towards them who were not in a concentration camp? Yeah, so the, um, you know, from the, the, the 10 concentration camps, um, most of them came back to the West Coast. A lot of them resettled in the Midwest and the East Coast. The, the government actually encouraged Japanese Americans to not return to their original communities. Why they, was that? Well, they, they, they felt that, um, uh, that they, they want to get rid of sort of these, these ethnic enclaves, almost like ethnic ghettos that they, they thought of. That would be better from an American standpoint if Japanese Americans assimilated Mm -hmm. throughout the, the country. Did you grow up in an ethnic ghetto? Uh, no, no, I did But again, you, you think about in terms of the sort of the social scientists of that time and what they were trying to do, try and promote, you know, this melting pot uh, sort of I ideal. And with that, uh, they actually thought, well, ideally it would be great if Japanese Americans lived everywhere in the country, kind of spread out. But then what, you know, from a culture standpoint, you then lose this rich sort of neighborhood the, the food, the uh, vents, the organizations would all sort of be destroyed. You know, luckily, um, places like Seattle, San Francisco, LA, uh, that was retained, but many of the smaller communities disappeared. Mm. We've run out of time, but I've got time for one more question. What's the future of the Japanese American Legacy Project? So the future, when, when we first started this project uh, 18 years ago, um, we wanted to do um, a, a job that could create a model for actually for other communities. Now, although we started for the Japanese American community and knew that this was going to be really important for Japanese Americans, we wanted to do it in a way uh, and to develop the technology and the methods so that other communities can learn also. So the future is to start helping other communities to collect and tell their stories in the same way Japanese Americans have. Tom, congratulations with your project, and all I got to say is, is go. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you very much for being with us. Great, thank you. Tommy Kata of Densho, the Japanese American Legacy Project.